Good morning and a very warm welcome to all of you who have only joined the webinar and I, uh, this morning uh, and I can see other people joining in um, as I speak. Uh, the webinar today is Introduction to Lean Now uh, with uh, Randall Benson and it's brought to you by Swift Kanban from Digitech. Uh, Lean Now is a special method that has been developed by Randall uh, which he will be talking about in detail uh, and it addresses the issues that uh, a lot of organizations have faced in implementing lean and going through a long term large initiatives that uh, have frustrated many teams, many organizations and have not led to the kind of benefit that they uh, expected to see as part of those lean implementations. And uh, lean now uh, is a method that uh, uh, addresses that and provides you a new way to do uh, the thing that you would want to as part of implementing lean. and. Uh, achieving some of the benefits of uh, Lean. Uh, so the agenda for today is uh, we'll start with a uh, quick introduction and a word from the sponsor, that's uh, Digitase Swift Kanban. And then uh, I'll hand over the reins to uh, Randall uh, to give us all uh, introduction to Lean now. And then we'll open it up for Q&A at the end of that. Uh, just a few uh, housekeeping <coughs> Items. Uh, we will take questions questions uh, via the Q and A box that uh, most of you should be seeing on the bottom right of your screens. Uh, you have, please uh, go ahead and ask questions anytime during the webinar, and if needed, we will take them up during the webinar. But uh, most likely, we will leave them for the end of the uh, presentation by Randall, so that we can take them up all together in a in a logical way. Um, we will take them up in the order that the questions are uh, received. Uh, and just so you know, the webinar is being recorded and uh, we will provide you a link to uh, the recording as well as to the slides uh, that you can download uh, after the uh, webinar is completed. Uh, we'll follow, follow up in a day or two with uh, an email and uh, the links will be available as part of that. Uh, so with that, uh, let me uh, go ahead and introduce uh, the speakers today. Uh, Randall Benson is CEO of uh, Benson Consulting. Uh, he's a lean consultant and coach, and he's also the author of the book, The Quest Effect. Uh, my name is Mahesh Singh. I'm co-founder and senior vice president of product at Digite, uh, the makers of Swift Kanban. Uh, a little bit more on uh, Randall. Uh, Randall, as he calls himself, is a self-confessed lean heretic. Uh, and he'll probably talk a little bit more about that during the webinar. Uh, he's a lean consultant uh, and a coach and has done a lot of training around lean and related topics. <clears throat> As I said, uh, he's also the uh, author of The Quest Effect, a book that uh, uh, helps organizations explore uh, the potential that they have in order to grow. Uh, and and uh, Randall has worked in a variety of industries including manufacturing, distribution, healthcare, government and, and uh, and several others, <clears throat> and he's based out of Seattle, uh, in the Seattle area actually lives slightly outside of Seattle. I'm based out of the Bay Area here in uh, uh, close to San Francisco, um, and um, uh, sometimes we we joke about the contrast of weather uh, between the Bay Area and Seattle, uh, but uh, we'll uh, not worry about that today. I think we, we see great weather here as well as in Seattle. Uh, in the meantime, quickly a word from uh, uh, about uh, about Digite and Swift Kanban. So Digite is a yeah, it's been around since 2002, and we are really a pioneer in web-based collaborative products and solutions for uh, geographically distributed teams. Whether you have teams in the same neighborhood but in multiple buildings, or you have teams around the world, uh, we provide uh, tools and technologies and solutions that uh, enable them to uh, collaborate better at. A, variety of projects, especially uh, technology projects, product development and software development type of projects. Uh, we are headquartered in Mountain View, California and we have offices uh, in Europe and in, uh, in um, Asia Pacific, uh, both resellers and our own offices. Uh, we have over 300,000 users uh, using our products worldwide and our products uh, cover lean Kanban, agile uh, application lifecycle management or agile ALM and project portfolio management. And Swift Kanban is our flagship Lean Kanban product. <coughs> I must apologize to uh, to all the attendees today. I am suffering from a bad bout of allergies uh, uh, at this time of the year here in the Bay Area, and my apologies if I suddenly become noisy on the line. Um, just a, a little bit of an introduction to our overall product stack. 
uh, and as you can see here we really cover uh, the overall gamut of activities that most technology organizations uh, typically do which is in terms of uh, project and portfolio management, uh, building, uh, implementing, maintaining a variety of software uh, application products that you see in the middle of the stack here and then of course all of the uh, IT operations, dev operations uh, that uh, uh, they run the business of any organization. Um, we also have an under, underlying process lifecycle capability that allows our customers to uh, define a variety of different processes. Uh, most of our customers have, uh, you know, a combination of uh, lean and agile uh, as well as uh, traditional methods that they might be using for different types of products and applications and projects, and we provide coverage for that. And underlying all of that is an, a strong integration bus capability, which we call Swift Sync, which allows uh, our products to integrate with a variety of uh, tools that you have in your organization to make sure that you have uh, complete uh, visibility across the overall development or implementation lifecycle. All of that is visualized through a combination of uh, Kanban boards, dashboards that let you uh, collaborate, uh, visualize your workflow, and really effectively manage overall uh, projects and operations. Uh, and along with that, uh, there goes there is a lot of capability for collaboration, metrics, and dashboards that let you uh, <coughs> work effectively to manage your uh, product and projects uh, that you might have in your organization. And finally, uh, just a quick smattering of the variety of customers that we have. Uh, around the world, uh, and you'll see some names that you probably recognize here, very respected uh, names, uh, and we work, uh, you know, around the world to help these customers uh, implement our uh, products for successful uh, project and uh, project delivery and software development within the organization. And with that, I'm going to hand over the control to uh, Randall, and uh, Randall will take us through uh, Lina. Thank you, Mahesh. Just uh, give me a moment here and I will get my presentation up and running. All right, well, I'd like to thank you all for coming today and joining me in this webinar. Uh, it's an introduction to Lean Now. I'm Randall Benson and um, I hail out of uh, uh, the Seattle area, a small island out in the Pacific Ocean actually, about uh, two miles offshore. And uh, I'm just really glad to be here with you folks this morning. And for the uh, a few folks I know that have joined from the United States, uh, um, good evening to you and I'm glad to have you on board as well. So today I'd like to talk about, um, in the next 50 minutes or so, talk about several ideas that I think can change the way we think about implementing lean in most of the organizations that we work in. Um, so I wanna talk about the Lean Now idea, what it means and how it came to be. Um, talk about becoming lean and why it's been so hard uh, for many organizations. Uh, talk about an alternative approach, which, is, which actually breaks some of the rules of traditional lean in order to make it uh, fast and powerful uh, for uh, many organizations how it works, um, why why we're able to do this, and why we're able to break the rules and still uh, accomplish uh, effective results in Lean. Uh, what the benefits are to taking this approach versus versus the traditional approach to, to Lean implementation. And finally, talk a little bit about how this approach eliminates waste, which is one of the core um, values of, of Lean. So for many of us, uh, you know, we belong to a new generation of lean leaders. I guess I can't include myself in that. I came from the factory floor. I've been doing this for a few decades now. Uh, but most of the people I work with today don't work on the factory floor any longer. And if they do work for a factory, they're probably one of those 90% of the people in factories who actually work in some other part of the manufacturing organization. Uh, so most likely, uh, those of you on the, uh, on the webinar with me today don't work on the factory floor as well. So this overview is about making lean accessible for approximately 90% of us uh, who work in services, high tech, healthcare, government, nonprofits, and so on. And uh, this is true both uh, in the United States and in Australia. The, the numbers are quite similar. In Australia, the, the employment in non-manufacturing is just a little bit uh, higher than it, than it is the United States. But both. Both economies are, are overwhelmingly uh, service and non-manufacturing oriented. Um, so the vast majority of organizations 
in this situation to become lean right away, become lean now. Uh, and this overview is really intended to explain how we're able to uh, implement lean within a matter of days and weeks as opposed to months and years using the traditional uh, shop floor or oriented approach toward lean implementation. So if you haven't started lean yet, um, you'll see how to implement lean in 30 days or less. Uh, you'll, uh, if you're already doing lean, you'll see how to achieve results much sooner in your implementation. And if you're doing lean, chances are I can show you a thing or two during this webinar that'll help you do lean a little bit better if you're in a, in a non-manufacturing type of organization. So probably worth just spending a moment here talking about the definition of lean. The one that I use has evolved a little bit over the decades. Uh, but I use the definition of creating and sustaining an uninterrupted flow of customer value by involving everybody in the elimination of waste in every form. Now, this is a little bit different than the traditional definition, which is really the second part, involving everybody in the organization in the elimination of all forms of waste. That was the traditional definition, and it's actually got us into a little bit of trouble. So I've added the first part there just to balance it out and to focus the uh, the implementation more on flow and, and a little bit less on, on uh, removing waste at the outset. So when I say become lean in 30 days, what I mean is that you're managing daily operation with lean principles and you're able to improve continuously. So there's lots of things that you may still need to do. You may need to reorganize the workplace. You may need to reduce more waste. Um, and that's great, that can come after we're operating with lean principles. But what I'm trying to do with lean now is get right to the point when we're able to operate with lean principles effectively. So I imagine you being in one of these situations, a service, high tech, healthcare, some non-manufacturing um, organization or the non-manufacturing part of a manufacturing organization. And you're here today because you have an interest in becoming lean or you are lean and you have an interest in becoming more effective at being lean. So my goal is to make lean easy for you and to make it easy to create a success story of it lean in your organization. The problem's been that um, for most of us, lean's been difficult and expensive to implement. Um, most organizations that I work with that are already doing lean have spent months or years in the implementation process to get, get to that point where they're doing lean effectively. They spent uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, occasionally millions of dollars in consulting fees to get there. And they've been on a cycle of endless uh, waste removal which has taken um, you know, many months or a few years, which has been most of their work at the front end of their implementation process. They suffered from disruption in their business operations and just kind of this organizational fatigue as a result of having such an extended implementation time. And it's also drained resources from the organization and led to sagging support for the project. So uh, some, some leaders that I've worked with uh, have been very concerned about the fact that uh, the organization itself is losing interest in the lean implementation because it's lasted so long. And also, um, there's often an expectation that when we start doing lean, we're going to get bottom line results right away. But when the implementation itself takes months or years, then we have to postpone those bottom line results until, we, until we're actually managing with lean principles. So lots of times I'm working with executives who are also dealing with the disappointing um, the results that they've been getting where they have local improvements, but the improvements don't seem to be changing the bottom line results uh, that much. So I think I kind of started to make the point already that in my belief, we're limited by the factory floor approach and this tyranny of the orthodox approach to, to lean implementation that really has uh, originated on the shop floor Toyota over 50 years ago and has changed very little in that time. And I believe these approaches have really lost their relevancy in today's non-manufacturing organizations. And the new generation of leader uh, really shouldn't be using these approaches any longer um, because they result in these lean implementations that are lengthy affairs with high costs and disruptions and lots of roadblocks um, and producing the um, disappointing bottom line results, as I said before. So um, 
you know, I think what lean leaders want to do today is they want to implement lean rapidly without excessive cost disruptions, hassles, and roadblocks, and they want to get bottom line results quickly rather than having to wait uh, a long time to see the results. So you can think of orthodox lean this way. Um, the front end of orthodox lean, and based on experiences on the factory floor, have been to eliminate waste, to reorganize the workplace, to co-locate the people in a very small area that are doing a, a particular type of production, and to make the status as visible as possible. In a factory, all of these things involve physical barriers. And, and the physical barriers have to be removed before we can change the flow in the factory. So waste often has to do with mountains of work and process that are in boxes and crates and containers that are actually in the way of flow. Um, the workplace reorganization means moving large machines and all the, uh, all the supply infrastructure required to uh, support the machines, the air, electricity, large pads to put the machines on, things like that or replacing large machines with, with several smaller machines. Um, and then moving the actual equipment and machines and people into manufacturing cells so that we are able to uh, do the flow in a small area. Also re removing storage and working process and other things that affected our line of sight. So all of this took, takes a long time and is difficult to do and is required upfront in order to establish a flow in a manufacturing organization. But in service organizations, this, most of these barriers really don't exist. We don't work with the same kinds of, of large pieces of equipment and, and physical work and process that we do in a uh, manufacturing organization. Moreover, um, a lot of organizations I work with, because the definition of lean is to reduce waste, have been caught in this forever loop of continual uh, waste reduction as a front end process. So they may not actually be removing physical barriers to flow, but their concept of what lean means is to reduce waste. So they've started uh, many, many Kaizen blitzes, Kaizen events to reduce waste. And of course, there's no end to the amount of waste you can identify. So these organizations spend months and years simply reducing waste, believing that that's the heart and soul of lean, when in fact, creating flow is really where we wanna start. I remember working with uh, Ted. Uh, he was a, a director of lean implementation, the, the lean office at a small hospital corporation in the U.S. Uh, they had about five hospitals, as I recall. And um, when I met Lee, uh, when I met Ted, uh, he'd been working for about a year and a half on lean implementation, and yet he wasn't even close to actually managing uh, any of the administrative or care delivery processes with lean principles. Instead, he'd been involved with the things that you see here on the slide. In fact, I actually took these items, and this is a, a small subset of all the items he'd been working on for the first year and a half. But his lean office had been doing all the setup and upfront and, and waste reduction and reorganization work to prepare uh, the organization for lean. And they probably had another year to go, and he'd already spent about a million and a half dollars on lean consultants, and he was probably going to spend another million dollars in the coming year before he was even able to say that one of his departments was operating on a daily basis with lean principles. So to me, that's a quintessential example of the danger of applying the manufacturing model of lean implementation uh, to a non-manufacturing organization like healthcare. Um, and th those of you who work in IT might see uh, or sense this kind of uh, uncanny resemblance between traditional lean implementation and waterfall methods in IT development, this kind of basic upfront uh, loading of the process and long implementation times before anything's actually delivered. Where I think we should be is a model that, that can do rapid implementation. I mean, and I'm speaking of implementation in weeks uh, and not even months, it's certainly not years, uh, to be lower cost. And by lower cost, I mean a, a, an order of magnitude, a tenfold reduction in the cost to do implementation. Um, and that does targeted waste removal, but doesn't get caught in the waste removal loop that lasts for years, but instead reduces the waste that can be targeted by flow and that slow the flow down or, or create problems in the flow itself. Um, it should be smooth and easy to implement 
and it should get quick bottom line results. So instead of waiting for a year or two before we start seeing results to the bottom line, I'd like to see organizations be able to, to see bottom line results in the first uh, few months of operation. Um, it should be easy to sustain support because the project doesn't last for many, many months or years. And also it would allow organizations that have been too small to do lean because of these upfront costs, it should now open lean up to those organizations and allow them to also have access to the power and capability of, of lean operations. So that's what I, that's my uh, idea of how, uh, where lean now needed to go. So getting to lean should be easy. And, and we try to say, um, you know, 30 days or less, you should be seeing results and managing the lean principles in your organization. To do that, uh, we need an approach that's purpose built for non-manufacturing that isn't simply the uh, traditional orthodox approach and that leverages available technologies, uh, not technologies that are on the bleeding edge, but also not the 50 year old technologies that are part of standard lean implementation. So, so by purpose build, I mean, it has to work for the peculiar uh, situations that uh, non-manufacturing businesses face. For example, most, most work areas in non-manufacturing are personalized, um, the product's intangible. Uh, we have a lot of variation in demand because there's no finished goods inventory to buffer demand. Um, we have virtual work groups that come together from all parts of the world to work together. Uh, and um, many of those people work in not one value stream, but work in multiple value streams at the same time. So if I go and look on someone's best, it's quite um, possible that I'll see work from several value streams sitting on their desk at the same time. So it's a much different environment than manufacturing and, and requires a different approach. The good thing is, is that because we don't have a lot of physical barriers to flow, we can actually uh, get to flow a lot faster in service than we can, or non-manufacturing than we can in the shop floor situations. So the solution that I've come up with is to do flow first. And so instead of front loading the uh, implementation with a lot of other things, I try to help the organization get right to flow as fast as they possibly can and then manage that flow with lean tools, which I'll talk about here in a second, um, which make it easier to visualize the flow and, and reduce the requirement for reorganizing the work, the work area and co-locating the employees. Uh, use, use the flow once we've established it to target the waste. So usually the model's been create a value stream map and then use the map value stream map to, to identify areas where a lot of waste exists and then drill down in that area to find waste reduction or to find opportunities for waste reduction and then start Kaizen events to reduce that waste. So what we want to do instead is use the flow itself to target exactly the waste that's, caused, that's the rate limiting factor in flow and attack those things first. Um, use that to streamline the flow and then quickly try to create immediate end user benefits and bottom line benefits as a result of uh, being able to manage our flow uh, very rapidly. So now we have flow at the front instead of flow at the back. And so we do flow first. That allows us to use flow to eliminate waste, to, uh, to uh, avoid having to organize the workplace up front, but to identify where a disorganized workplace is a hindering flow and attack those areas first. And to make the status of the flow very visible um, using um, some new techniques. So one of the techniques is that's very important to lean now is the idea of the Kanban board. So Kanban board's not new. It's an idea that came from manufacturing. Uh, the real difference is, is that uh, the, the, the folks in uh, Agile IT project management have created um, uh, electronic virtual Kanban boards that are absolutely fantastic. And so what I did is I borrowed those board, the idea of those boards back from the, uh, from the IT area and applied them to other areas of lean. So the, uh, the kind of Kanban board, this is just a simple diagram of a one here, but a, but a real Kanban board is, a, is part of the, uh, the reason that the process works as fast as it does. So that's the idea behind lean now, really it's a method for, for 
doing lean in this non-traditional form uh, by starting with flow, uh, using the Kanban boards and other uh, I, other uh, current technologies instead of 50-year-old technologies uh, to allow us to visualize the flow and use the flow without having to do all the removal of physical uh, barriers before we get the flow. And Lean Now is uh, based on a series of really quite simple steps. So if you think back to Ted, the guy in the hospital, and all those steps that I had up on that slide, this approach is considerably simpler uh, in, because we were able to tailor it uh, for non-manufacturing companies. So start out with uh, the idea of under, understanding the lean principles that apply to non-manufacturing non organizations. Uh, we pick a value stream and map it, but instead of then going after waste, we use that value stream map to build a virtual flow via a, a virtual Kanban board and then use uh, the idea of, uh, of pull and, and Kanban to uh, set the queue limits uh, at different stages of the flow and then implement flow and manage the flow on a daily basis, then use that flow to eliminate waste and thus further streamline the flow and get into the continuous improvement loop. So all that can be done in a matter of um, uh, a few weeks, uh, 30 days at the most. I've, I'll be starting a project next week, in fact, where we're working on this five full days in a row, and at the end of the fifth day, we'll be managing with, uh, with lean principles. So the first part is to understand the lean principles, and um, you might be familiar with the lean implementation stories about um, sending your uh, staff off to uh, another city for a week or two of lean training or going on factory tours in your country or another country, traveling to, uh, to Japan, for example, to visit lean factories there. Um, that's great, and if you have the money and time, I recommend it. But what we found is we can get about the same thing done. In fact, sometimes it's more effective by just playing some games instead. So what we've developed is a conference room simulation uh, to show how uh, organizations can um, um, transfer from the idea of uh, kind of the traditional process management approach to, to lean flow, and uh, we can do this in about half a day and uh, have, have people that participate actually see how going to lean is going to change their work and change the way they do work and are able to see the benefits of, do, of uh, going to a, a lean flow model. And so it's a simple game with four phases, but it has a dramatic transformation that's, that's part of the, uh, of the result. So I just took, took a summary here. I cut out phases two and three, but over the four phases, you can see that it's a dramatic uh, change. Uh, throughput's reduced by about sevenfold. Rush time, which is uh, the time to actually create the product if there's no delays, that's cut in half. Working process was cut ninefold. Productivity skyrocketed. Uh, customer backlog was reduced 75%, uh, and so on. And I particularly love uh, the, the last one here, the, the actual perceived effort to do the work went from high to very low. So even, the, even though the productivity has gone up dramatically, the perceived effort to, to create the output went down dramatically at the same time. And that's a, that's a result we count on. But after a half a day or so, and then an afternoon debrief of what this all means for, for the organization, we're able to actually move right into the design of the flow itself. So we apply the ideas from the simulation uh, to the business processes at hand. Sometimes it's really easy. Uh, I remember working with a bank where uh, it's, this was in the loan processing area where the president of the bank, after sitting through the uh, simulation in the morning, said, uh, I want to do that right now. This is, this is so close to what we do that I can see exactly how it would work for loan processing. I just want to get this started next week if we can. Uh, other organizations need to talk longer about uh, how this fits their organization and how the metaphors map over to the actual work they do. So, so that's the idea of using uh, simulation uh, instead of classroom training and, and visits to organizations to understand how to apply lean principles in a non-manufacturing organization. Second thing we want to do is we want to pick a value stream to start with, and we want to map that value stream. And, and Right now, I'm using traditional value stream mapping techniques that manufacturing companies use. I may uh, change this here in the future. But this is basically a, you know, a high-level flowchart of the work uh, in, 
in the sequence and captures the important time flow information across the bottom of the chart so we know how long it's taking uh, for work to be completed once the, uh, the demand is identified. We actually know how much time it takes at each step. And so um, the timeline across the bottom is real important. And uh, I think one of the weaknesses of this approach is it really doesn't show enough about um, customer touch points. So um, in the future, I think I'll be adding some, uh, some technology from, from service blueprinting and customer experience mapping to enhance this, uh, this idea of uh, the value stream map. But the value stream map is really useful because if we had to, if without the map, we actually have to go out and physically figure out what's going on in an organization that's, that's non-manufacturing. Some of this can be quite challenging. For example, here we are uh, looking at uh, photographs from a client of mine, a government client actually, uh, who's challenged to create visible flow. And you can see that the work areas are very cluttered. There's from everywhere there, work in process is stored. It's unclear what, what is work in process and what is, is, is just file storage. Um, I don't know where the work piece is. I'm not sure what's work in process. Um, no one knows what the backlog is in terms of how long it takes to respond to a customer. Uh, we don't know what, what work is blocked and what work is actually flowing. And um, we also don't know what's waiting for a response from someone, a phone call back or or another piece of work to be completed. It's all buried by the clutter and disorganization and the personalization of the work areas in the office area itself. So it can be quite a challenge. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner picture here of the cubicle area, which is quite typical uh, of, of service operations, it's very difficult to understand where the flow is because the cubicles weren't designed for flow. Uh, they're designed to, for personal workspaces. So flow has been covered up and buried uh, by the design of the office itself. Uh, and of course, we can redesign the office, but that doesn't happen in days or weeks. Uh, where, where's the customer stuff? You know, lots of times customers call and say, when will my work be ready? When I'm waiting, I've been waiting a long time. I want to know where it is and when it, when it will be done. And so even finding customer, customer um, files in this situation can be kind of difficult. Where's the staff? Well, you can see in the bottom uh, example here, the staff doesn't work in the office all the time. Here they are out in the field uh, doing inspections. Uh, this is this person's actually inspecting for uh, for uh, for rats or for um, illegal dumping for the government for a county government organization. So they're not in the office to be part of the workflow. They're out in the field and they're generating data and information out in the field that if we had a virtual system could be connected back in so everybody else could see. Uh, where the flow is going as well. As it is, that person will have to come back to the office the next day before they become part of the office workflow again. The third part is setting up a virtual flow and setting queue limits around that flow. And you can see this little picture here of a simple little post-it note board. And that's the basic idea of a, of a Kanban board. And uh, that's the key tool to visualizing the flow in the Lean Now process. So what we do, is start with the uh, value stream map and then take the processes from the value stream map and, uh, and put them as column titles on a Kanban board itself. Um, so you can see that uh, e each of the stages of the Kanban board uh, has, a, um, has a different work step in it and um, we can follow the, uh, the cards across the work steps. So in this case, the cards are uh, blue for uh, illegal dumping complaints and they're yellow for uh, rodent complaints. And so these are the actual, this is an actual piece of a board where we're uh, looking at how, uh, how the flow of processing these complaints is going. Now this board actually has uh, 18 columns uh, on it, which is much different than the Agile uh, IT board, which usually has three or four or five columns on it. So uh, unlike project management, when we're doing workflow, uh, we're, we're going to want to have a step for each of the um, key areas of the workflow and then follow it across the workflow. So here's an example of, a, of more of that same Kanban board. Again, it's not all 18 steps, but it's about half of it. And uh, each of those cards is associated with actual real work, uh, documents, forms, database entries, et cetera, um, that are connected to these cards. And uh, then these, this board was customized um, based on the process flow we, we developed through uh, value stream mapping. 
the, the limits, which uh, you can see at the top of the columns, actually tell us how many cards can be in a column. You'll see that uh, a couple of the cards are circled in red, which means they're blocked. And also one of the columns uh, is, is partially blocked, which means there's, there's, uh, they've exceeded the limit uh, for the number of cards in that column. So um, in this way, we actually use the board not only to visualize the flow, but also to keep track of, um, of the work in process. So we set work in process not as a byproduct of our operations, but work in process is set by management policy when we use a Kanban board. That's one of the keys to lean management of flow. Therefore, we know what the throughput time is of, of a board based on what the, what the limits are, and the throughput time doesn't uh, grow as the backlog grows in, as it was with this client before they started the Kanban board. So it's very predictable how long it will take the work to go through. The reason for that, of course, is that most of the time work is in a flow, even in a lean flow, nothing's happening to it. So the, the value-added work isn't what generates the long lead times, it's the, it's the waiting in queue to be worked on that generates the long lead times. Therefore, if we limit how much is waiting to be worked on, we actually manage the lead times, the throughput times, uh, through this uh, process. And uh, this organization, for example, was able to cut their response times uh, by over two-thirds as a result of uh, using this approach. The trick here is not having beautiful flow. You don't have to uh, maybe put a bag on your head and be embarrassed about your flow, but we're not looking to make the flow attractive. We're not looking to put a bunch of upfront effort into creating the, the opportunity for perfect flow and then implementing that perfect flow. Instead, we're just going for a minimum viable flow. What's, what's the ugly flow that we, can, that we can put on the Kanban board today and then once we start with that flow and manage it with lean principles, one of those lean principles is continuous improvement. We can, we can improve and streamline and remove the waste from that flow uh, rapidly over time as we use the flow to identify what are the rate limiting factors that keep us uh, from having a better flow. So the flow will in, improve through continuous improvement and we'll use uh, the traditional PDCA, Plan Do Check Act, or Plan Do Study Act uh, model uh, to, uh, to do the improvement. So we don't need to get distracted by all the waste that we see in our business operations and our processes at the beginning. We can wait until we get the flow working, even if it's ugly flow, and then use the flow itself to tell us what waste we need to go after. The next part is to implement a flow I'm sorry, implement pull and to, to manage the flow using pull. So flow, I'm sorry, pull keeps the flow from getting clogged up with a lot of work in process. And it also shows where problems exist right away. So we don't wait until we have a huge backlog and we're months behind, but we can see problems that are blocking the flow right away. And we're able to turn our attention to those problems before they get to be disasters. And finally, it prevents folks from feeling really overwhelmed by the mountains of work that they haven't gotten to yet because we keep the work on the board limited by the Kanban limits. So it feels like a manageable amount of work. Um, so it's, it's just good internal lean hygiene to, uh, to limit the amount of work in process. And it's much different than the, than the push model. I was just working with a, a client last week and one of, one of the owners said, you know, we love push because the more we push into the organization, the more we're going to get out the other end. And uh, that old constipation cure model really doesn't work well at all. In fact, uh, in most organizations, for example, the government agency with the photographs we just looked at, they were able to dramatically improve the throughput of their flow uh, once they stopped stuffing it with work in process. So this idea of limiting the work in processes is, is critical. So here's an example here of... Um, just a piece of a Kanban board. And you notice at the top, it says letter slash close. That's writing a letter to the uh, violator or closing the complaint. And it has a limit of 15 in that column. And there's nine in the column right now. So we're okay, nothing's turned red. Uh, if we wanna get more work and we're allowed to because we're not at our limit, we go to the column before and we drag something over. So I'm gonna grab that you know, case 81 and I'm gonna pull it over to my working column. And, um, and that'll allow more work to be pulled into the column before me. 
At the same time, I'm going to complete case 94, which is a, a rodent complaint, and I'll move it down into that area that's called ready to pull down at the bottom of the diagram. That means the people in the next column over, which could be me or it could be somebody else, can now grab that and move it over into the next uh, stage of work. And in that way, we kind of move the work through the Kanban board in the flow uh, from one end to the other, each column limited by that uh, number at the top in terms of how much we can have in the column. So I can't push work to the next column. So when I completed case 94 there in the center column, I couldn't just push it down to the person who's writing the, uh, the letter. Uh, that person that's writing the letter has to come get it from me. And if they don't get it from me and I continue to pull work from the earlier column, pretty soon I'll hit my l limit of 15 and I'm going to have to stop working. Uh, I won't uh, not stop working, but I won't be able to pull any more work into my area. And then the person uh, upstream from me is going to eventually fill up. And so in that way, we create this artificial crisis right away. In the factory days, that meant turning on the uh, yellow spinning and on light and people would run across the factory floor to see what the problem was. Well, here we're going to have a similar situation. We want the supervisory people to respond to this. And when they start to see the Kanban limit uh, being hit, are being the limit being uh, achieved and start to ask how can we fix the problem where do we need to move resources what's going on here how can i help so that's how we manage on a daily basis using the board um, a lot of the work uh, because we can't put it on the board actually goes into a backlog so when the customer sends us work if they don't have room on our board right away then we move it into a backlog area and then it would be usually a supervisory responsibility to move the work from the backlog onto the board and then once it's on the board the flow is very predictable so from the customer viewpoint the work can be two places either we haven't started it yet or it started and therefore it will be completed in whatever the set time is to flow through the Kanban board. So we try to, we can avoid almost all the status, you know, where's the work and what's it going to be done by using this approach. And of course, what we'd love to have is a, a very small backlog relative to our flow so that we uh, know that our capacity is balanced. In this case, it looks like they have more work to do uh, than they have the capacity to complete possibly. So we'll probably want to do some more improvement there. So what do supervisors do? What do managers do in this situation? Well, their job changes dramatically and dramatically for the better in most cases. Um, <clears throat> so they'll get involved in establishing the, uh, the Q and WIP limits and setting up the Kanban board in general uh, for flow, uh, releasing backlog to the board um, to work in process, assisting uh, when the limits are hit in terms of uh, figuring out why we have a glitch in our flow. Uh, supporting improvement projects and improvement efforts, helping the team get what it needs so they can keep, keep their work flowing without hitting those Kanban limits, uh, rebalancing the flow as improvements are made, uh, tracking metrics for the process such as uh, burn down or burn up reports or, uh, th or throughput time reports to understand what the performance of the flow is, uh, and basically um, staying out of the way of employees who are quite capable of pulling their own work through the process. So most of, most of this is self-managed and to be run by employees without the, without the um, kind of like the detail intervention of, of managers. So managers kind of move up a level to more strategic work as a result of working with the Kanban uh, flow model. The next step is to eliminate the waste and streamline the flow. So as, as I said earlier, we could prob possibly and probably have a pretty ugly flow when we begin, but we're going to use that flow to eliminate the waste because it works so much better than using the value stream map to eliminate the waste because at the at value stream map level, we can identify too much waste that will take a lot of time to eliminate but won't necessarily improve the flow. And if the if flow doesn't improve, even though we've eliminated waste, nothing will drop to the bottom line of the organization. And it's likely that the customer won't see any improvement either. So we really want to focus on the waste that's, that's um, blocking flow. And, and doing flow in the Kanban board helps us get to that right away. To, to improve it, uh, to, to improve the flow, uh, the plan D check app improvement cycle uh, still seems to be the best. Um, I'm sure many of you are very familiar with this, but again, it, we, uh, we want to use this kind of Deming Schuhart model to create a spiral of ever more ambitious improvements that will lead to real breakthroughs in how we do our work and how long it takes us to uh, meet customer uh, demand after we identify it. 
So we can use another Kanban board. So this is a different Kanban board. This is a project Kanban board, not a flow Kanban board. But here again, we got to use the tool a second time to really keep track of what improvements we're working on. And you'll see in this that the Plan Do Check Act is baked into the middle of this Kanban board. You can see it in the column titles. And um, it allows us to actually track what we're working on and not overwhelm ourselves with too many improvement projects at the same time, which oftentimes is a real disincentive uh, for employees who feel like they're trying to do their regular work plus work on a bunch of improvement projects. Uh, but again, everything must be verified and uh, with trial data if possible so that when these are recommended uh, as improvements, they've actually been tested and therefore it's very quick and easy to improve them and use those improvements to streamline and, imp and improve the flow itself. So what we want to do is use these improvements to make the flow faster and also uh, make the flow uh, produce uh, less variation, less waste, um, and less non-value activity. So here we are streamlining the flow. Uh, by first doing the first we identified the problem in the flow, then we did the improvement project. And then once the improvement project is completed, the idea is, is to go back to those Kanban limits and reduce the Kanban limit because we won't need as much work in process uh, if we have a smoother, um, less error prone flow. So in this case, we've reduced the letter close Kanban limit from 15 to 10. And now we'll see if we can run with 10 instead of 15 without a problem. And when we did that, we reduced the throughput time on average for all of the work that flows through this value stream and improved customer um, service, as well as re reduced the waste in the, in the value stream itself. So everybody wins when we can use this to, uh, to improve the flow. So that's how it loops back using two Kanban boards to both run the, run, the, uh, value, run the value stream on the Kanban board, identify opportunities for improvement, then using the Kanban board a second time to track the uh, improvement ideas, which then come back and, and allow us to reduce the, uh, the uh, Kanban limits. So at this point, I'd like to just ha ask you to think for a second. Um, given these five steps that I've talked about here for, for a few minutes, can you imagine using those steps in your organization? And how would using these steps compare to what you know about traditional approaches to implementing Lean? Would this seem like it would be easier? Would it seem to be faster? Does it seem less hassle prone than doing, doing Lean the traditional way? So the situation basically was is that we needed an alternative to a long, expensive, and unproductive lean implementation process. So we needed to be able to go rapidly from zero to lean. And by rapidly, I mean in weeks or months instead of months or years. So the idea of lean now is to try to put, um, turn this into a, a, a routine process that we could repeat by doing flow first, by creating virtual Kanban boards as a way to track the flow without av actually having to change the workplace itself and do all of the upfront uh, waste reduction we'd have to do to create physical flow. Uh, you, to use the flow to target waste and then to uh, remove the waste and tighten the flow and then tighten that flow for awesome outcomes both for customers and for our own bottom line. And to be able to get to those outcomes quickly instead of having to wait, as in Ted's case, um, having to wait um, months or years in order to get uh, a system that's actually producing those bottom line outcomes. So that's the idea of lean management uh, in 30 days or less. And uh, that's basically the idea of lean now. And uh, at this point, um, I'd like to stop talking and uh, kind of um, hear from you folks and field some questions uh, from, the, from the field here from those of you who are attending. <coughs> Sorry about that, Randall. Uh, thank you for a great uh, great talk and uh, great introduction to to Lean now. Uh, let's keep the let's keep the focus on uh, Randall uh, Randall's slides in case we need uh, him to show something um, 
uh, from his slides. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's keep him as presenter. Uh, Randall, a number of questions have come in. Uh, let me start with a few that that are uh, that are sort of basic questions around the uh, Lean Down methodology uh, and uh, his background. Uh, so there's a question from Jacqueline. Um, you know, who say that why why hasn't someone done this sooner? Why I guess the question really is um, if we have seen problems with sort of the traditional methods of lean implementation, uh, why hasn't uh, such a method come along before? I guess. Well, I guess that's my job as a uh, self-proclaimed heretic is to challenge the assumptions uh, in traditional lean. Uh, what I think happened is basically in the 1990s. Um, Lean became solidified and, and the ideas became well documented and the language became standardized across the world for what, what uh, the Toyota production system means. It became lean and we kind of understood the concepts. And since then, I think that the orthodoxy of lean has been very powerful. There's a large number of people who are kind of keepers of the truth who uh, have, have pointed us back again and again toward traditional lean implementation. And we simply just haven't challenged the underlying ideas. Um, so it was only my, my frustration with uh, with clients who wanted to go faster and want to bottom results and didn't have a lot of money to spend that kind of uh, finally got me to start challenging assumptions I'd held for decades about how lean had to be implemented. Great. Um, and uh, before I go on to the next question, I, I, I believe that there are a couple of uh, people in the in the webinar today who have had uh, audio problems and uh, uh, my apologies for uh, you know uh, for that uh, in case uh, it is the webex uh, system that we use for uh, these problems uh, irrespective what we will do is to make sure that we send you the recordings of the webinar so that uh, uh, so that we uh, you know make sure that you we get to see and listen to the whole uh, whole webinar. A uh, couple of other questions, uh, Randall, which are similar in nature. Um, a question from uh, Jonathan: uh, What are what are the drawbacks uh, if we if we use an accelerated uh, version of uh, the typical lean implementation? Are there any drawbacks to that? Uh, and a similar question from um, uh, from Alan, uh, who says that is this sustainable? I guess the the, the concerns are around. Uh, you know, uh, if it's a dramatically different approach and uh, uh, somewhat of an accelerated approach, is there a sort of retention of that uh, on an ongoing basis? And are there any drawbacks of the accelerated approach? Yeah, um, well, the biggest drawback to the accelerated approach is, is that it won't work in manufacturing very well. So we, we um, they already, manufacturers already have a traditional model, so that probably isn't such bad news. But it is true that this is like a subset of all of the lean possibilities that, that it works with. Um, there, there are some drawbacks. I think, for example, working with one government agency, I found out that once they got the, uh, the Kanban board built and were getting immediate results, they didn't want to do improvement anymore because they, they were satisfied with the results that they got from the first you know, phase of implementation. So sometimes it's so fast and and so um, the change is so dramatic that people think they're done and don't actually move on to the continuous improvement process. Um, but other than that, uh, I, I don't uh, I don't see a lot of drawbacks to it. It's so far it's uh, this work this worked very well. Um, and the, the question of sustainability does does come up frequently. Um, and it really goes back to an idea that came up in the early, not in the early, but the mid 1980s, which was this idea of islands of lean. And in the 80s, we tried to do lean on a small scale basis to start with and then grow, grow the lean implementation uh, from those small areas, which were called islands by other people. And the idea was is that people were saying, well, that's why we're not getting bottom line results is because we're doing these islands of lean, but the islands aren't connected together well enough to actually create um, create lasting benefit. Uh, in fact, they were wrong. Um, in the you know in the first decade of this century, we've looked at studies that have shown that the the, the results from lean haven't improved. Uh, since the 80s, so so even though we started doing wall-to-wall -wall implementation of lean and stopped doing the islands, the, the results actually didn't improve. So the theory was wrong, but it did cause us to do these great, big, huge, uh, up front-loaded lean implementations as a result. 
The reason it is sustainable, in fact, it's incredibly sustainable, is because you can get your results so quickly um, that, that it encourages people to do another one and another one. So, uh, and the second thing is we look at an entire value stream, not just at a, at a department. So by doing a, a front to uh, beginning to end value stream uh, as part of the Lean Now implementation, we're actually producing end user benefits and bottom line results right away. And it's those bottom line results and end user benefits that are really driving the desire to do this over and over again. Now it is true that if you do Lean Now in multiple areas, like multiple programs uh, at my government client, I'm thinking of, then um, you may need to coordinate to coordinate and organize those those different areas together with a di an additional layer of uh, of lean principles. So lean, lean now isn't um, it, 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 it's um, it's not a wall to wall model, but you can do it over and over again with inside your walls. And what it requires then is a is a level of uh, coordination between the different areas of lean. But that coordination is nothing like the problems in the 80s of, of the islands of lean because we went from the beginning of the value stream to the end with each lean now implementation. So they really can stand alone uh, and produce bottom line results, but also can be easily coordinated if that's necessary. Absolutely. And I think that the, the point that you made about uh, you know, rapid uh, sort of uh, implementations leading to uh, other people being encouraged to uh, you know, try it out and to, and, to, and, to, and to go on to the next value stream and to uh, sort of continuously deliver value uh, um, is so similar to some of the uh, methodologies like in lean and agile in the, in the technology world. So I think it makes perfect sense. Mm -hmm. um, a question from Jeremy, um, and his question is that uh, can you create uh, can you create a visible flow for a coal marketing team? Uh, what was the team? I... Uh, uh, coal marketing. Uh, coal? Like coal fields. Uh, coal, C-O-A-L. Yes. Um, it's, it's simply a matter of being able, I mean, um, everything is a process. Um, so if we can understand the flow of work through processes, then we can apply the Lean Now model. Um, I imagine that marketing would be, um, um, you know, done in a lot of places. It's probably a very virtual process. It probably doesn't have a lot of tangible impediments uh, to doing flow. So I would think that that would be just an ideal kind of situation. For example, next week, uh, one of the projects I'll be working on is uh, is customer onboarding, which isn't dissimilar to what he's talking about. And with onboarding, that means bringing the customer in after the sales made and setting up the customer. And so in that case, they're, they're using Lean now to do that customer setup. And uh, uh, we've done it once before, and we, we know that it works quite well for that. Right. And, and I want to Sorry, go ahead, Dan. Um, I was going to say, so I, I would encourage him to give it a try and see if he can apply these principles to, to the marketing area. Absolutely. And in fact, I was going to say that uh, we have used uh, uh, Kanban, our own products of Kanban and Kanban principles for uh, our own marketing and sales activity. And uh, uh, I use it regularly uh, f uh, for that purpose. They certainly uh, provide sort of very collaborative, uh, you know, um, environment where senior management and and and, uh, and the marketing and sales teams can uh, really figure out what's going on, what needs to be done, <laughs> what are the, some of the coming events and so forth, and it really helps uh, make the overall delivery of uh, marketing and sales uh, milestones much more uh, smooth and and obviously in the long run uh, of great value. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we have a question for uh, we sort of time for one last question, um, and it, it, in a way that's been answered. But uh, the question from Victor: uh, How is this different than Agile? And I guess we sort of talked about that a little bit. But do you want to talk right. a well, it's a, about that? It's a really important question. Um, the way I like to look at it is Agile is primary, primarily a, a, a project program management model, and uh, Lean Now is a flow model. And where they where they join uh, at the hip is they both use Kanban boards as a way to visualize the work. So in uh, Agile, you might have uh, you know a ready doing done kind of model, or you might have a ready and then have three or four steps in the middle and a done. Whereas in uh, in in uh, in flow, a repetitive 
processes, we would expect to have more processes on the board as we try to track the uh, work through through the work processes. Um, so, so one is uh, repetitive work, and the other one is project work. But uh, they use they apply a lot of the same principles. Um, you know, a lot of agile principles obviously came from Lean to begin with. Uh, the use of the Kanban board was much further developed um, in Agile than it was in Lean, so we're going to borrow that back. And by the way, I should mention here that uh, I looked at a lot of, uh, of uh, Kanban board uh, tools to try to apply to uh, process work, and almost none of them would work because they were they were hardwired for uh, Agile development or Agile project management. So it was really great to uh, to find the folks that. Uh, digitated do Swift Kanban because it was it was a tool that actually could be used uh, to replicate uh, and visualize um, process flow away from IT, which was what I needed. But uh, yeah, with the right tool, uh, it's it's, uh, it's doable. So so the differences are are flow versus uh, project work. I'd say repetitive versus project work. Right. Right. <laughs> Apologies for that again. Um, uh, I'm going to take a couple of other questions that came in, uh, uh, Randall. One of them applies to uh, um, the academia, and uh, uh, there's a question from Saifuddin Ahmed uh, who says, how does it apply to university or college, ad college administration? And I, I, I would think those are great uh, areas to, again, uh, mm -hmm. use, uh, use lean principles and lean now, right? Certainly is. I, uh, 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 Two uh, universities have been clients of mine uh, on the administrative side, and and one also on the um, um, the research side. But uh, administrative processes at colleges and universities are uh, are very similar to uh, to work processes in other non-manufacturing organizations. So, for example, we worked on uh, onboarding new employees uh, as an example, and also uh, the recruiting process for for new staff. Uh, that would be the kinds of things that universities do. Uh, on their on their administrative side, but uh, the administrative processes in the university are are pretty much the same as other organizations. And in fact, what I noticed was is that lots of times um, a university runs like a small city, so there there are many more processes uh, in university uh, admin departments than in typical um, for-profit organization admin departments. So they work both like a government and like a uh, a business at kind of at the same time, but uh, Almost all of the processes that are uh, administrative, as long as they're repetitive, uh, can be uh, amenable to, to the Lean Now model. Absolutely. Um, one last question uh, that I'm going to go ahead and take uh, is from Nigel. Uh, uh, he's uh, saying, do we have uh, uh, more presentations, papers, or other information on applying uh, lean flow principles in finance, legal, or corporate services functions uh, that they could uh, that you could use uh, as a follow-up read reading material. And uh, I can answer that briefly from my side. That yes, we do have a lot of uh, uh, material available. We'll 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 certainly uh, send you those. Uh, those and Randall, uh, did you have any other uh, information for uh, for Nigel? I'm working on two case studies now that'll be available in the next month or two on uh, specific applications uh, of Lean Now, and also there's a implementation webinar that we're working on that will be uh, a follow-on to this is another way to get uh, more information. Um, so okay, as we great. More, we'll, we'll, we'll have more case studies. Right now I'm, I'm too busy doing them to, uh, to write the case studies, so I need to get back <laughs> on that. All right. Uh, I guess we are really out of time now, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, take the liberty of closing the event now, and uh, uh, we'll take up any other follow-up questions uh, that uh, that are there uh, in, in emails that we will uh, send out to all the attendees uh, as a follow-up to this, uh, to this uh, uh, event. Uh, Randall, thank you so much for a great uh, talk again. A very interesting topic and a very relevant one for for many organizations that are trying to, uh, you know, uh, sort of pursue enterprise agility and uh, and lean principles to to deliver overall, uh, you know, quality and value to their customers. So I, I think really um, interesting. Um, 
content in this presentation and i know that we will we will we are going to have a, a follow up uh, presentations and events on lean now uh, that are going to provide to all attendees here um, you know further follow up uh, uh, guidance on how to how to apply some of these uh, to their uh, specific situations. Uh, thank you to all of the attendees uh, for for your time today. Really, we really appreciate uh, your spending this time with us and and for some of the great, some great questions that came up during the event. Uh, we will follow up with you with uh, an email with contact information for uh, uh, the speakers today and 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 also links for downloading the slides as well as to uh, recording of the event. Uh, Randall, any final thoughts or should we close? Oh, I'll be a good time to close. I just want to thank everybody for uh, participating today. It's been a pleasure to be online with you folks. And uh, uh, I, I miss Australia. I haven't been over for a few years now, but it's certainly one of my favorite places to go. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. Thanks uh, once again to everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>